Today we're doing a shrimp gumbo pot pie. Sounds delicious. Sounds confusing. <laughs> you know, it sounds confusing. I probably figured out like which one is it. Right. So well, normally you need an oven for a pot pie. Normally you did. I just improvised since we didn't have an oven. No, I already had it without an oven. It was making it easy. So <laughs> it's just a different variation of gumbo. So I'm from the north. I'm not from the south. So therefore, I know nothing about like southern gumbo besides like eating it when I go to New Orleans. But so therefore, what I did was make a northern version of it with things that. We normally eat up north, you know, so therefore I substitute a lot of the things you would see. It's not really a dark, earthy, watery, soupy gumbo. This is more of a thick, rich, creamy, velvety, smooth, you know, like te te texture is there. It's just a different type of gumbo that we would eat in the cold. Because it's not cold out down south. No, not you know? yet. <laughs> they, they don't get to, to make it for us, you know, so I'm going to go ahead and turn these on too while we're talking. So these are induction. Good thing is I never cooked on induction burners. So if I make a mistake, I'll show you how to fix it. Nice. So that'd be the good part about yeah, this. Yeah, they so. won't let us have open flames. I don't yeah. know why. Ever since I came. <laughs> <laughs> they changed the rules. I seen an open flame on the last one. Where should we start? So what we're going to do first is we're going to start with our roux. We do the same basic things that gumbos do. So we do start with a roux because you do need a thickening agent. So we start and put a little bit of butter. And I usually put some oil in there too, just so the butter doesn't burn. Because the, the temperature of butter is so low, like it burns very easy. Yeah. So the olive oil helps cut that. So I got my butter going inside of there. At this point, I would add some garlic okay. because we're making a northern gumbo. So I got my garlic going in there. And then I'll add my vegetables. Normally with a gumbo, you'll so see you a lot of- flour first usually, right? Yep. Yeah. Add, but that doesn't make sense to me. You know, if it doesn't make sense, if I can't tell you why I'm doing it, I can't do it. You know, so I can't understand why you add the vegetables after the flour. It seems like you want the vegetables in there with the butter to get the caramelization and get the flavors out of it. But hey, I'm not from the South again. So there'll be a lot of answers I won't have for you today on why they do what they do. So therefore, I like to add it to the actual butter to it. That is a classic thing. Like you'll see it and like chefs I look up to like Emerald, like that's how it usually gets done. That's the traditional way, but yeah. I'm not the traditional chef. Really out of the box. Like when you come up with a shrimp gumbo pot pie, kind of. Yeah, for sure. But you know I'm going against the grain right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is heating up right now. So it may take a second just to heat up and then I'll add some of the vegetables too. I do need to add some oil. So how did you get into cooking? I got into cooking because I thought I was good at cooking because we used to cook breakfast on the weekends at my cousin. Mm -hmm. And like when I got older, it wasn't until like last year that I realized that we never really cooked on the weekends. We just like made cereal with cheese and <laughs> warmed up pizzas. And I was like, we, what do we ever cook? Never cook no bacon, we never cook nothing. But that was our version of cooking as a kid. Whatever you eat is cooking. Yeah. You know, if you get a- Cook a sandwich. Out, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Number one thing was warming up pizza. Yeah. That's the number one thing you did. And we used to make these slushies too, like, you know, put your drink in the freezer, let it get cold, and you know how it goes from there. So that was my version of cooking, but I um, used to watch Food Network when it first came out. Same, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Emerald, I just, oh man, I'm a huge Emerald fan. Yeah. Huge. He's really the one who got me wanting to actually cook. He did like, a talk here a few years ago. I know, that's why I'm doing gumbo. Because <laughs> <laughs> Emerald did gumbo. So I was like, you know, I'm not trying to one up him. You know, I'm just trying to pay a little homage to him. So therefore, I was like, I'll do some gumbo. And then I got a really good gumbo I do. It's a shrimp gumbo pot pie, a little different. So I'll Let me be useful. I can take some in for you. <laughs> so really watching him on TV really opened my mind to say like, wow, like this is something different. I never knew a chef. I didn't even know how the yeah. food was being made at McDonald's when we used to get it, you know? So I didn't understand nothing about cooking. But when I seen him on TV, I started to understand and I started to like it because he was himself. Like, he wasn't like no one else. Yeah. You know, and like, I, I liked that a lot. I wanted to do something that was different. Now, if I wasn't a chef, I would have been a Navy SEAL. Really? Yeah, uniform. I would have been in a uniform no matter what. You know, like when you're in school, you hate wearing uniforms. You got to wear them. But then the older you get in life, like you like the suit, you like whatever it is that you like. But for me, I love chef coats. Like my partner designs these ones that you can tell. You probably never see one like this again. But uh, so I really enjoy like the, the seriousness that comes with being a chef. But Emerald was the one who really got me there. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go to vocational school for it. So I went to high school for two hours and then I went to school to be a chef. Yeah, we had that in our school too. Did it? Yeah, it was called K-Tech. Yeah, vocational. Yeah. Where are yeah. you from? Virginia from Charlotte's. Okay. Because yeah. they don't have it in a lot of places. Most yeah. people are like, what? You can only go to school for two hours? Yeah. Everybody would have did that. <laughs> so therefore, um, with the vocational school, and that was where I found out I was really, really good at cooking, or my teacher was really, really good at lying. 
I was like, it, it, one of the two is happening because she really encouraged me when I did my first knife skills ever. And I'm adding a flower to it now because my vegetables softened up some. So I go ahead and add my vegetables. And I'm actually going multitask right now. And let me help you in some way, just as long as I don't burn something. Well, I'm used to being in the kitchen with a lot of pans going on at one time. It makes it fun, you know, like when you see people in the kitchen doing multiple things at one time. I'll just be Vanna White. <laughs> so I got a little uh, flour going in there for the room. And I'll explain why I have this pan on in a second. It's another thing that people do when they make gumbo, I don't understand. So um, do you have a, I'm not going to use this. Can you season, oh, here you go. Can you season the shrimp? Sure. These shrimp right here mm -hmm. with a little salt, pepper, and Cajun seasoning. Perfect. And this? Yes. Or on top of it? No, you can do it either one. I just didn't okay. have a bowl, so I figured that would be next best. So I got my roux forming now. Add a little more flour to it. And usually they want a dark roux when you do a gumbo. I'm not going to do a dark roux. I'm going to do a light roux. You know, like, this is totally different. So therefore, I do a light roux, which is more for thickening and less, and less for flavor. I'm going to get the flavor from everything else I add to it. You know, where a gumbo really gets its flavor from that roux. So I got that thickening it up. You want to cook out the flavor of it, though. So where are we at as far as the story goes? Oh, vocational school. Yes. So I went to vocational school, and the first time, what they do in vocational school is they give you a big potato, and they give you a chef's knife. And they give you a board that has every single knife cut on there. And they tell you to make your potato into those cuts. And I did it like, I really believe, and it's so long ago, you know, they say every year you lose 50% of what you thought you knew. You know, so therefore, I really believe I did these nice skills perfectly. And my teacher came up to me, she's like, have you been, how long have you been cooking for? And I said, this is my first time ever somebody gave me a knife. And she was like, oh my gosh, you look like you have 30 years experience. She's like, this is the kind of nice skills people have when they've been cooking for 30 years. Wow. And I was like, wow, I've been waiting to hear that my whole life. Like, yes. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> she knows exactly what she's talking about. So what I'm going to do next is, I'm going to go ahead and add the shrimp stock right there, if you can okay. get that for me. This? Yes. You want to add a little shrimp stock to this for me? Cold stock, hot pan. That is one thing that is going to always be similar to anything you make. Oh, a little more. You can go ahead, a little heavy. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. More or good? A little more. All right, there you go. So if it's too thin, she poured too much right there. Oh, sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> Then you just add more flour, right? Yeah, we'll just add more flour. We add more liquid. This is easy. If it gets too thick, add more liquid. If it gets too runny, add more flour. Add more roux. Make a roux and then add it to it. Don't just add the flour or you won't have the consistency you want. So, okay, where are we back on our story now? Knife skills. Knife skills. So, yeah, she came up to me and was like, yeah, your knife skills are like a 30-year-old chef. I'm 32 now, so if my knife skills are like it is today, then I was on the right path. So, um, from there, I was playing sports at the same time, and I thought that I could like be a professional athlete. Yeah. Except for my body didn't agree with it. Like I wasn't big. I was always very skinny. Up until like three years ago, I was, I'm, all, I'm six four. So I was always six four, about 150 pounds. Oh wow. Wow, you didn't respond well. Uh, You're <laughs> like, <laughs> oh wow, oh man, that's like you gotta eat. No, but uh, <laughs> but that's very small is what she was getting to. So therefore, I finally put on some weight, but I didn't have what it take. But when I um, got into cooking, I found something that I was really, really good at. And um, I just kept going with it. But cooking wasn't cool back then. That's when Food Network first yeah. started. So I was ashamed of being a chef. Didn't tell nobody this is what I was doing. Kind of hid inside of my vocational school. It's kind of crazy how it, it changed so much today. Um, so we All were going because of Food Network. Exactly. Yeah. To be honest with you, that's, that's the real yeah. reason. So you put salt, pepper, and Cajun and seasoning on it, yes. right? All right. So I have my pan over here. Can you bring your shrimp over here for me? It's like an olive oil. Can you put them in here? Mm -hmm. That's what you want to hear. So, by nature, the shrimp would be added to the gumbo and just let it cook and it would cook through like that. Me, I want to sear it. I want to get the flavor to stick to the shrimp. I just don't understand why they wouldn't do that first. So therefore, like, if I was to season these shrimp up, right, and then put them in my gumbo, the seasoning would just go inside the gumbo. But if I season the shrimp and sear them all first, then when I eat that shrimp, the flavor is going to be attached to the shrimp. Yeah. It makes sense. You see, man, hey, 
You should have your own Food Network show. Hey, well, say it again one more time. <laughs> you, know? you should have your own Food Network show. Say a lot of the people in the back. You know, like, that's what I'm talking about. It's actually, about. watching Red to Ray is actually how I learned how to cook. What oh, is? Yeah, 30 oh. minute meals. Well, yeah. Very easy. She has a big tie to Emerald as well. Yeah. She has a very big tie. I love the food. The Food Network's like my Saturday morning cartoons. <laughs> I, I watch it every Saturday. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is add some heavy cream to this. Just a little bit. Didn't you go to the Olympics and you were a chef at the Olympics for the 2008 Olympics? Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, a little bit? No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> No. So, uh, yeah. How I was did a, that happen? I was chosen. Uh, they chose... So at the time, it was we were going to be the first students to ever cook for the USA team. Wow. And um, it was from, the catering company was from New York, from Staten Island, called oh. Frambois Catering. Uh -huh. And they came to Sullivan and they chose, I think, 21 students that would be a part of that first team. And I was one of the 21 that was chosen. Wow. It was, that without that experience, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be, oh man, without that experience, you just, there was a cultural experience. It was a, man, you just, so thankful for work, you know, like you got to see so much from me. I was in, I was in Beijing for about three months cooking for the USA teams. Because you get there before the Olympic starts and you get and you stay a little bit after it's over with. So I cooked in the USA house, which was for all the athletes after they won. Oh, wow. No athlete would eat in the USA house who hasn't medaled yet or hasn't got out the Olympics yet because yeah. we didn't have no recipes. That was the thing that blew my mind. I've always been a confident chef until I got to the Olympics. When I got to the Olympics, I'm like, oh, they don't have recipe books of whatever we're going to do. They didn't have one recipe book. What did they you do? I, I winged it. We did. Yeah, winged it. They just expected you to know how to cook. Wow. Yeah, like, you, we were still in college. So they were like, I, and this is funny, like, I'd never made ribs before. That was one of the things. So I went down there to do the Anheuser-Busch Celebrity Deck. So we did all small plates, and that's why I really enjoy doing small plates now. And um, we were really open from, like, 1 in the morning to 5. Wow. Oh, it was, it was a great thing to be a part of. And, um, but when you got there, everything changed. You know, we really worked from 11 to about, 11 a.m. to about four in the morning, which was, I had to learn early, like, you know, this, this career yeah. is not playing no games. You know, like, it, it's an all day thing. So I got my shrimp seared off. Nice. And then now I'm gonna add my shrimp to my gumbo. All right, now we're going to start letting that cook. I don't want to burn this. I'll put that right there. Sit this on here. Has anybody ever cooked with induction before? Mm -mm. So the cool thing about induction is that you can't burn yourself. It only reacts to metal. So therefore, it could be hot as ever and put your hand on it, and you won't get no reaction from it. So it's for people who really are a little shy on cooking, like you really worry about burning yourself a lot, this is a good thing for you. So for now, I have some salt I'm gonna add to it. You wanna do the pepper, the thyme, and parsley. Well, bam. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> and then here you go. We got some thyme and parsley. How much, just a little bit? Yeah, a little, let me see. Yeah, that's good. Cause the key is we're gonna try it out and taste it. If you put too much in it, then we got to yeah, undo it. So we're gonna put some Cajun seasoning in there. You can go a little heavier on occasion. I don't mind spice, so. Gotcha. Well, then we got next two things that'd be fantastic for you. We got smoked paprika. All right, definitely spicy now. Uh, and then we got cayenne. My favorite. All right. Better more. Oh, that's good. And we'll let that cook. So we're going to start, then we're going to add. So normally when you see somebody do a um, gumbo, they use the Holy Trinity, which yes. is um, celery, onions, onions, and peppers. The peppers, yeah. yeah. So forget that here, you know? Uh, we did a mirepoix because it's what it taught me in school. It says I pay so much for school, I might as well teach, might as well do what they showed me how to do. So but what we do do for the peppers, I do papadou peppers. You ever had papadou peppers? No. It's like a hot pepper that's been pickled. It comes from like South Africa. It didn't know that. Like I had to, I was looking stuff up to make sure I was on point today. You know, like where do these come from so I can give them some good information. So if you want to get some peppers for me. So instead of doing the trinity. You cut them up or just throw them in? Yeah, actually I'm going to. Okay. How are you with a knife? I mean, you know, Tom, I won't cut myself. Okay. It might not look pretty. <laughs> so if you just want to give a rough chop to that. How many? That's cool. That's cool. Okay. 
Again, watching the Food Network. They'll teach you everything you want to yeah, know. they do. There you go. The key to cutting anything is how you're going to eat it. So and if I was myself. eating this, I would make it big enough that I could grab it with a spoon. You know, you make them too small and you're fishing for it. You know, you don't waste your time fishing when you eat them. Oops. Let me see this. All right. While you're doing that, I'm going to start on the crust. So the crust is a Parmesan cheese crust. So what I'm gonna do is take a nonstick skillet, I have it on medium heat, and I'm gonna spread out shredded Parmesan cheese. And listen to me, when I, the most important part to understand is that it has to be shredded. If you use grated, you won't get the same exact product. And I wanna do enough to cover the entire pan where you can't see anything at all. Here we go. And this is gonna be the actual pot pie shell. And I thought it, was so, thought it was so good to do it like this because it has like a cheese base in here. So it's going to accent go really, really well for it. So I'll let this cook. Should I put the peppers in yet? Yes, you can go ahead and put the peppers in there. Turn that down. So as you'll notice, it has every single component that a, root, that a gumbo would have. Just some of the flavors are like change a little bit. It smells really good. Thank you. Let me see this. Oh, that's good. I usually would just dip my finger in it, but I was like, ah, people are gonna say something about this. <laughs> like, don't do it here, <laughs> not on TV. <laughs> so, okay, so we have some Gruyere cheese. Can you put some Gruyere cheese yes. inside of here? Add just a little drop. Man, that tastes like a gumbo, for real. A little more? Uh, a little bit more. Okay, so you're in the Olympics. Yes, in the Olympics cooking for the USA teams. I get back and it just changed my life. Like, I went from like liking what I do to like being infatuated with what I do. Like, I was like, okay, how can I be the best at what I do? I already knew, the cool thing was, I knew which, which most chefs struggle with is I knew who I was already as a chef. So usually, I would say probably and then so on this, the one thing to remember is when you see any holes inside of there, you want to go back and put some more Parmesan cheese just so the liquid doesn't seep out of it. So the cool thing was when I got back from the Olympics, I knew who I was as a chef. It helped me understand who I was because for a lot of chefs, you're underneath great chefs so you become their identity. I mean, you cook like they yeah. cook. You do what they do. You know, me, I've always been a rebel. So, so therefore, I knew like my style of cooking was to go against the norm and to show people what food could be compared to what it's already been. You know, I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. I just shined it up a little bit, you know, put a little spray on it. It wasn't really much to it. So therefore, I'm gonna go ahead and flip this over because it's been cooking. So I have my Popeye shell flipped over right there. Okay, I didn't know if they could see it or not. <laughs> So yeah, got back from the Olympics and that's when I really took cooking seriously. That's what it really became like my love. I was like, man, I, I seen everybody who was doing it at a high level and they were doing it so aggressively. Like they weren't just trying to cook great food. They were trying to change everyone's like total conception of what they were doing. So I was like, let me try to do that as best as I can. There are a lot of fusions that happened, I feel like in the last 15 years or so. Yeah, and I forget how long, okay, so this is the fun part. You got the <laughs> lid? A lid. Oh, here yes, it goes, right yes. Oh, that lid. Okay, so you're gonna hold this for me. Yes. My Vanna White skills again. <laughs> so this is hot. So you wanna take this, put it over here. Don't let it fall down, because if it falls down is where your holes will start being made at. And it is hot. I just make it look like it's not hot. <laughs> you know, don't be at home like, why, is it, why didn't he budge at all? Something wrong with me? No, my hands are hot. My fingertips are, are gone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I, I just don't feel any heat no more, which is good for me because you always touching something you ain't know it's hot. Um, so there you go. And then you can model it for me if you want to, Vanna. <laughs> and that is the Popeye base. So you do the same thing for the top. So we're gonna put this back on, sprinkle a little bit of Parmesan cheese, and now we're gonna make the top for it. How big is that? At the same time, the gumbo is just cooking down. The flavors are intensifying. Everything's just 
getting where you want it at. So how long after you got back did you open your first Super Chef? I got back in 08. I opened my first Super Chef in 2012, I think. Oh, so four years. A, a long okay. time. I went through a whole lot before that happened. You know, I had, uh, went through a lot of, like, just being in and out of jail, a lot of trying to figure out life, and a lot of trying to make more money, and not really trying to understand that this, this thing called life is a long-term thing. Yeah. You know, like, I wanted it really, really fast. You know, when you, when you graduate from high school, you kind of think, like, okay, I told myself, I'm going to have a white BMW by the time I'm 19. <laughs> Like, I don't know why I seen Get Rich or Die Trying, and 50 Cent had one. So I told myself, it was a Benz. I was like, I'm going to have a white one. He drove it off the lot. I was like, I'm going to have a white one like that by the time I get done with college. Because to go to school to be a chef is the fastest college in the world. Like, you're in and out of there in the same year. You know, uh, it doesn't take a lot. As long as you pass your classes. Then it could turn to a four-year university. <laughs> so therefore, like, I had to really, I had to fail a whole lot first. You know, like, you would think, that because we have a lot of restaurants now and we get to do a lot of different Food Network shows and stuff, that it, we always did it like that. Nah, before I had a dumb point in life where I was doing a lot of stupid stuff, trying to figure out life, but trying to figure it out the easy way. You know, it wasn't until I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna go through life and go through whatever I need to go through to get to where I'm trying to get to and not complain about it. I always used to complain, but now I just like, ah, it is what it is. And you see that color right there? That's exactly what you want. And another thing, another note if you try this at home, is don't do it on high. You'll see a lot of places and a lot of restaurants will do this on high, and then you'll eat your Parmesan cheese, and it'll taste burnt. Mm -hmm. Or it'll taste like, like, what is that? What's the word I'm looking for? It'll Gross. taste, yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah, it just won't taste right. <laughs> you know, so just let it cook slowly. You don't want to ever see anything dark on it. Um, okay, so how are we looking over here? So since this is Parmesan cheese, it has a lot of oil in it. Here we go. I'm gonna spin that off there. Voila. So this is our Popeye. And by nature, I would tell you at home to put it in the cooler first before you take it off of there. Because if you put it in the cooler, it allows it to get stronger, it allows it to really firm up. So therefore, that's our Popeye shell. Wow. This is our top. Right, size that right there. And this is where everything matters at. I want to cut it so it can actually look like a Popeye shell. Actually close it up nice. So how do you think of all your recipes? Because you have a lot of really creative ones. I looked at the website and I was fantasizing about if I went to eat there what I would get. <laughs> it's like the Elvis pancake. Yes. It has the bacon in the pancake. Yes. I would have never thought to do that. Well, I really, I don't even know. If I knew how I thought of it, I would think of more. <laughs> but to be honest with you, it's just a gift, and I'm really just living in my own gift. Like, so if more things come to my mind and I can't do nothing with, then, um, then I have somewhere to put them. So therefore, like, even when our new place we opened up in Atlanta, like, I'm happy we get to do like three courses every Monday yeah. because I get a chance to put things out of my mind somewhere. So it's I'm like always thinking of something, always. It's just like, it never stops. Like, have you known something? Can you stop thinking? Like, I, never, no, I can I never stop know. thinking about what I'm gonna do next. <laughs> So therefore, I'm gonna go ahead and put my gumbo inside of it. How do you decide what location you open restaurants? Well, investors, whoever yeah. wants to give me some money. <laughs> <laughs> whoever wants to give me some money, you know, we can make it. We can make it happen anywhere. We can go to Alaska <laughs> if we got the right people. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but that's really it. Now I'm at the point where I don't want to do everything, but like my wife would probably tell you, like I had a plan. I did. I had a plan on how many restaurants I was gonna open and where I was gonna open them at. And then I, the next two stores were not in that plan. And she's like, this doesn't go with her plan at all. I'm like, I know it doesn't, but it's, it's gonna be amazing. So um, I've learned to maneuver and be able to know, like, you gotta know where you're trying to get to in life and also understand that those things may change. You know, so the cool thing is I just know where I'm trying to get to, but I may have to do Atlanta first and Ohio next before I can go do Las Vegas and Texas. Yeah, or New York. Or New York, oh my gosh. New York seems to be the most difficult place in the world. Yeah. Oh my God, so many people here. How long does it take y'all to get to work? Like, I don't know, like 20 minutes door to door? Not too long. And I live in Harlem, but it's pretty quick on the subway. Yeah, no, the subway's fantastic. Yeah. That is fantastic. So this will go on top, 
and close up your papaya shell. And you can eat the shell. Yes. That's amazing. And then this is your shrimp gumbo papaya. That is awesome. Wow. Do we have questions? If for somebody who wants to go from doing like recipes to feeling more comfortable with impro improvising in the kitchen, what kind of advice would you give? Oh, that's good. I feel like I, I ask that question sometimes. I, <laughs> I would say you improvise when you know your product well. So maybe take more time like walking around. Most people don't do this, but like when I used to do cooking classes, before I ever showed them how to cook anything, before I ever showed them nice skills, we used to go tour grocery stores. I used to show them how to pick fruit, how to pick vegetables that are ripe, how to know the difference, because it's hard to, when you're not comfortable, it's when you can't be creative. Most creative people are comfortable in what they're doing. You know, so if you want to start being able to be more creative in things, know more about your product, because you're like, okay, well, I know, like, I don't know how to cook this, but I know something similar to it that I've messed with before, so therefore, you'll be like, okay, uh, it's just, when you want to get creative, just start changing the template a little bit. Mm -hmm. Find something that you like, like, okay, I don't like, for me, I don't like curry. So therefore, I would take the curry out of it, and I would add something else to it. You know, I do like turmeric, so I may I substitute it for some turmeric, but I would just say, get to know your product a lot more. Um, like, even studying, like, I know what papadoo pepper tastes like, and, but I had no idea that it was found in South Africa. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm like, when I start doing like a South African dish, like that may be the pepper I start to incorporate now. Great. Did that answer for you? Yeah, thank you. Oh, perfect. Hey, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I do a lot of cooking at home, um, but I also have two kids, so I'm always very busy and like tight on time. Do you have any tips for how to cook faster? Yes. Um, I let my wife cook at home. No, <laughs> no, but I would say meal plan is the key. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm very scheduled when it comes to like, for instance, I do these dinner parties every Monday now, but I have my menu written out for next month. Mm -hmm. So I know what I'm gonna do ahead of time, so it makes it easier to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's when you're usually thinking about it right before you need it, mm -hmm. and then it's a little more stressful, you don't really enjoy it as much. Mm -hmm. um, just invest a little bit more time in the pregame of it, which is what am I gonna do, what is my shopping list like, and then, um, make enough that you can have leftovers too. That's the key to it. Most people usually cook enough for dinner and then wish we had that for tomorrow as well. Yeah. Do you ever, whenever you do leftovers, do you ever use those and make up something new? When I was on the Ultimate Thanksgiving Challenge, yeah, yeah it, it made me do it then. Uh, but, I'm, but you won, so yeah, clearly I win, you so know. I know what to do when I have to. You know, like you never really know how good you are until you're put in a situation where you have to That's figure true. it out. That's very true. Um, so with leftovers, I never do um, because we. I got six kids, and um, yeah, so we don't usually have that much leftovers. A lot of kids. Uh, so I know you should have seen. We did something yesterday. The lady was like, "I heard that twelve kids." I'm like, "You doubled it." Uh, but uh, whatever, you know, six <laughs> times two. But um, so therefore. I don't really do much with leftovers next day, but I cook so much in the restaurants yeah. that when I come home, my wife is usually the one who's doing most of the cooking. And she thinks she's better than me at it too. You should be up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, anyone else have any questions? So I don't eat meat and my husband does. And so, but he's trying to meet me in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I still eat seafood and stuff, but so, do you have any suggestions for like trying to make different meals, like more vegan friendly or vegetarian friendly? Like what are your suggestions in terms of like finding new ways to cook vegetables, things like that, so they're tasty to a meat eater? <laughs> That's gonna be hard for me. <laughs> um, the, the number one thing is using vegetables that are similar to meat. That can give you a kind of like, mushrooms are really, really good options, like you probably already know, carrots, things like that. Mm -hmm. But one thing about people who eat meat is that we like the texture. Of yeah. meat. You know, I can get that flavor of meat from multiple different ways of cooking things, but the texture is a key. And if everything is a different color, I know I don't have any meat. So you want to kind of play with their minds a little bit when you're doing it. Like, you don't want to give them broccoli with carrots, with red <laughs> onions, with, because it feels like he's eating a pitcher. You know, like, he's, he's like, hey, where's my meat at? You know, like, you don't really notice it when it's just like one vegetable and has rice with it, like a really dark rice, you know, mm -hmm. like a rice peel off with it that really kind of reminds you of like, a, it doesn't really remind you of Salisbury steak, but it can like give you the accents of like, I'm not just eating vegetables, mm -hmm. you know, but definitely starches are going to be key for you. Okay. You got to give someone who eats proteins, or well, who eats meat that try to go help you out and go in the middle, a lot more starches. Like your rice is your potatoes. There's so many types of potatoes. You know, there's so many types of rice. There's so many different, like you got quinoa, you got so many types of grains. Like that's a big part that you want to introduce is starches. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, thank you. Oh, no problem. 
Uh, I just I think your story is really cool, and I was wondering if you could talk more about like, you know, like when times were really hard for you, like, and how's that influenced your cooking now, and like where you are at. Um, so that's a great question. So part of my story that most people like highlight, you see most stories is like going from living on my car to now yeah. in restaurants, and like. When I went to live in my car, which was for a short period of time, a very short period of time, um, I had already started to realize I had to take a responsibility for what I did. You know, because at one point, I feel like we, I could easily blame the world for doing something. You know, but at one point, I was like, you know what? If this is what I did, this is where I'm at in life, I got what I got. And now is my time to start doing things differently. You know, so what I did was I started surrounding myself with people I had never been around in life before. You know, like I stopped hanging with the same people I was hanging with, and I really started to surround myself with people I wanted to be more like. And believe it or not, like even from like six months ago, I started to be mentored by one of the best entrepreneurs in the country. He's voted that. <laughs> and I'm like, he's like, I'm like, I'm, I'm getting contact with him, and I'm like, someone wrote a letter for me. Like, hey, I think I should meet one day. And he's like, you could have just came into my office. <laughs> You know, but you don't understand how close you are to the things you want in life. Yeah. Um, so therefore, I just started to change my mentality. Everything for me was mental. No matter where I was at in my life, no matter what I went through, it was all about how I was thinking about it. That's how I got in the situation. And how I thought about it was how I was going to get out of the situation. So for me, I started reading more. Well, I listen more than I read. I listen to you do. I listen to different things, uh, read up on people that are successful. And I started to understand, like, when I got to be Emerald, spent one-on-one -on -one time with him, and he told me how many times he failed on TV, how many shows he had that got canceled, that he got fired from. I'm like, you would never know that happened to him. You know, so I'm like, okay. I mean, I ain't got canceled yet, but uh, I definitely got turned down. <laughs> you know, like, so I'm like, okay, I'm on the right path now. So I started to, and that's why now I start to make sure that my story is just as important as my food. Because a lot of people need to understand that in life, the biggest part of success is failure. If you want to be successful, you can't go around failure. You know, like Steve Jobs called it, the medicine the doctor prescribed. You know what I mean? Like, you need to go through failures, and you need to go through them the right way. The difference between where I was at then and where I am now is that I go through things the right way. I used to always go, I used to always run around it. You know what I'm saying? I used to always try to get the shortest distance to get better. You know, whereas now it's like, let me go through this. Let me feel some pain. Let me hurt. Let me remember what it feels like. That way I don't do this again. You know, like, that is a necessary part. And I remember somebody once telling me in my church, it's like the difference between where you're at today and where God wants you is your ability to patiently suffer. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, being able to go through something without complaining about it. Be able to go through something and still look at it through the, the silver lining that's in it. Like, no matter what you're going through in life, man, like, how you view it is how you view it. You know, so for me, I just changed my perspective. You know, like, people always say to me, like, oh, I don't forget people as fast as you do. Well, I didn't always forget people this easily. You know what I'm saying? So therefore, I, I, like, I train myself to do it. So for me, I just, I make sure now that the, my staff is just as much important, if not more important, than my customers are. Because I get a better relationship with my staff than I do my customers. Because my staff are with me daily, so I get a chance to inspire them. They get a chance to text me and be like, hey, chef, I really need somebody to talk to. You know, like, we moved to Alabama. And the one thing when we moved out of Alabama was that I never had so many people come to me for things. I've always had people come to me. But not like I did there. And everyone's like, hey, I just love to sit down with you and talk to you. Like, I never had any advice from a, a male for, before. He's like, hey, no, my mom wasn't there, my dad wasn't there. I just need some kind of direction in life. I don't even know where to start at. I'm like, sheesh, I'm trying to figure it out too, but let me tell you what I do know. And that's why my gift is important. That's why it's important for me to own restaurants because I get to connect with so many people now. I don't do restaurants because it's just the best way to make money cooking, because it's definitely not. <laughs> you know I'm saying? It's one of the most stressful ways to make money cooking, but it's not the best. The best way to make money cooking is catering. You know, like that makes the most money. It is simple. You know what you got, when you got it, when it's done, I can schedule everything around it. Restaurants, you never know what you get into, which is kind of like life, though. You know, every day is different. That's why I always tell my chefs before they leave, whatever needs to be prepped needs to be prepped today because you don't know what tomorrow's going to be. You know, like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow when I get in, and I'll come in two hours early. What happens when you oversleep? You know what I'm saying? Now you got me on top of you because you overslept and I told you you should have did it yesterday. So I really just try to live in today. If you maximize today, I used to never maximize today. I used to always want something better. I used to always want something better. Like I used to always be like, oh, when I get this, when I get my white bins, yeah. then you know what I'm saying? Then yeah, I'll be able to do happy. this. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. it's like, if you maximize today, you really give it your all. You really try to be intentional with people. You really try to get the most out of it. You'll realize today is the best day you could have. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't have that much I need anymore in life. You know, like, I do need my wife, because that's a big part of me, you know, but, and I do need my relationship with God, but outside of those two things, everything else is up and down. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everything else, yeah, I can't control it. I, I, I can't control anything, to be honest with you, but what I can control is me. And if you don't know who you are, it's going to be hard to control you. So the first thing I would do is figure out who you are. Because if I ask people all the time, I say, tell me your strengths and your weaknesses. They don't know where to start. I'm like, tell me, your tell me who you are. First thing they always tell me is their name. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to get more in the person, your name. You know, I didn't say tell me your name. Tell me who you are. You know what I'm saying? We used to do this thing. I stopped doing it, but I used to do this thing with my daughters to where I used to always be like, tell me who you are. And they used to be able to spill off every characteristic they had. I'm a child of God. I'm beautiful. I'm a great big sister. I got beautiful hair like my dad. You know, like, they used to just be able. But I had to tell them what to say because they don't know who they are. You know, like, no one told you who you were, so now the biggest thing you're going to try to do from where you're at today to where you're getting to is figure out who you are. And once you know that, you'll realize you can go through a lot of stuff. You'll realize you can take what's thrown at you. You know what I'm saying? That's usually, we just, we just doubt ourselves sometimes. Now I'm not doubting myself. Wherever I'm at is where I'm supposed to be at. And I just try to maximize it. Like, even, like, I was thinking, like, two days ago, I told my wife, like, I was so sick when I was in bed. I was like, there's no way I can do what I had to do yesterday. And then today, I'm like, there's no way I can do this today. And I was like, yep, you got to. You know what I'm saying? So you might as well change your thought pattern now. Because if you got to do it, don't have a bad attitude about it. You're just killing yourself. No, I agree. And I think that's what's so amazing about your story. Because not only were you homeless, then your first restaurant burned down. And instead of just being like, I quit this, you just picked yourself up and just kept going. And a lot of people don't do that, though. And that's amazing. Well, a lot of people don't do it because they've never seen somebody do it. Yeah. You know, it's hard to do something you ain't never seen before. Very true. You, know, you think something that's so catastrophic is supposed to tear you down. If you've seen somebody that went through what you went through, you'd be like, I could do that too. You know, so that's why it's important for me to make sure my failures are forward so people understand, like, okay, he may be on TV, he may be able to do these things, but he went through all this stuff. So I could connect with people on that. What you said just brought up, like, you can't, sometimes you really can't be what you don't see, or mm -hmm. do you mean it's nice you need an example? And, and something you said, like, when you asked, like, where, is it gonna, where are you going to open your next restaurant? You said, well, whatever investors <laughs> want me to, which I thought was funny. But I think there's a bit of truth to that, too. Like, you know, how do we sort of support more um, chefs like you who maybe have come from different circumstances? Um, I know there's, like, for me, like, seeing a lot of women of color and just specifically, like, Caribbean women chefs. Like, I'm Haitian. And so seeing more women who are starting their own restaurants, like, that can be hard. So, like, how do we support that just so more kids can see more people who look like them, like, who are opening, who are opening different restaurants or maybe have gone through tough things? Like, I think that was, that was interesting to hear about the investment part of it. But uh, Well, I think because the way of where we're at today is social media, Really, that's, I feel like that's everything today. Like, that is the biggest part of life for connecting to people is, like, sharing things on, like, social media. That's a big thing, but, like, and like you said, a good point. Like, I, I go and I speak to a lot of places. Just so I know, this pot pie is falling over because we didn't cool it first. Okay? <laughs> I don't want y'all to think it's falling over because of me. Usually you get in the refrigerator <laughs> and the cheese hardens. But since the cheese didn't harden, that's what we got. So just so we know that part, okay? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. You You're probably thinking, okay, his skills, a little off. Uh, but the key is, like, for instance, I'm so intentional with who I am and how I look, right? I have braids, you know what I'm saying? I get them done really, nice lady does them for me. You know, I have a lot of tattoos. Um, like, even to like, what cars I purchased now. Like, my wife was, she wasn't a huge fan now. I purchased an old school car. Old school drop top car earlier. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, she hasn't seen it yet. <laughs> it's getting fixed. Uh, it's still getting fixed. You just text me a day about how long it takes to get restored. Um, but I, I chose to get this old school car. as a drop top with big rims on it, stuff like that, right? And I chose to get that because people see me as a success. But when people see someone driving that car, they view them as someone different. So in my mind, I'm like, I want to keep the image that is so hard to get past. You know, so I buy the car that you would normally see someone that you would think of, oh, I got to watch out for that guy. But there's someone in there who's doing everything he's supposed to be doing in life, who when he sees you, he's going to smile at you. I, I speak to everybody I come across in life, you know what I'm saying, to where I get, I got to stop getting so mad at people. Because people don't speak to you. You know, you'll be right next to someone in the mirror. Like, How you doing? Put the head down. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I just want to say something to him. But so what I try to do is I make sure that I never forget where I came from. And another understand of the barriers that most people deal with where I come from is they feel like they got to change everything about them mm -hmm. in order to be successful. 
you don't have to change everything about you externally, but you have to change a lot internally. So therefore, that's why I focus on the, how you think, how you act, and all those kind of things, because it's very important for people to like, we in a day and time where it's so acceptable to have tattoos and be professional. You know, at one point that wasn't where we were at, but now it is. So therefore, it's just so important for me to make sure that I look like the kids from where I'm from. That way they know like, I can make it too. It's important that if I change everything and I dress total opposite, of, now I'm getting older, I don't dress like them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm 32, I ain't the 32 year old who still dress like the 19 year old. You know what I'm saying? But it's important for me to be relatable in that sense. You know, and, and one of the biggest things for me is the scripture says like, become like them to save them. If I'm so different from them, they won't follow me. Mm -hmm. They won't listen to me. You know what I'm saying? So I gotta stay in that realm of life in order to change that realm of life. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much for coming. It was such a pleasure to meet you. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.